Okay, welcome back. So hopefully you've had some time maybe to work on this problem. Uh, we're going to convert 40 degrees Celsius to Kelvin and to degrees Fahrenheit. So all we need to do essentially is remember our formula and then plug the numbers in the right place so that we can get to the scale that we want. Uh, it'll be common for us throughout general chemistry to work in Celsius and in Kelvin and not so much in Fahrenheit, but if you're from the US that's the way we normally do it. So we need to know how to work with those different um, different scales. So we have 40 degrees Celsius and we want to get to Kelvin. So we're given 40, we want to find K, and we know the equation to get to Kelvin from Celsius is we just add 273.15. So as long as we can do addition, we've got this problem taken care of. Okay, we also had to remember the formula. So 40 plus 273.15 makes 313.15 Kelvin. So 40 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 313.15 Kelvin. Now how about Fahrenheit? That one's a little uh, trickier. Since we already know the number in Celsius, it's easy for us to get to Fahrenheit. Normally we're going to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Celsius and then we'll usually go from Kelvin to Celsius or Celsius to Kelvin. So Celsius is that one in the middle that will allow us to get from Fahrenheit to either way. So we have 40 degrees C, we want to get to Fahrenheit. We remember that to find the degrees Celsius we have, we take the degrees Fahrenheit, subtract 32, and divide by 1.8. And so you'll remember uh, here then, according to the algebra, I just multiply by 1.8 on both sides. You can see 1.8 times degrees C, which uh, it turns out to be 40. And then we have on the right-hand side Fahrenheit minus 32. So since 32 is being subtracted here, we just add it to both sides. So we add 32 over here, plus 32, minus 32, cancel each other out. We're left with degrees Fahrenheit on the right. So all I have to do is take 1.8 times degrees Celsius plus 32, and I get Fahrenheit. So then all I need to do is plug in 40, and I find 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So 40 degrees Celsius is 313.15 Kelvin and is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And we could go back and forth uh, any direction that we want to go on that. Okay, one of the other things that's useful when we're dealing with numbers uh, in this sort of situation is to be able to uh, work with large numbers and really small numbers. And the metric system is great for that because we have these prefixes. So in essence, the SI units can be used with prefix multipliers, and you can see them in the textbook, or you can look them up online. Um, I don't think I have a slide that shows them all. However, we can go back and forth between really large numbers or really small numbers just by using a prefix to our type of units. And this is something that you've done before or used before and maybe didn't know it. Uh, to get from meters to kilometers, well, one kilometer is just a name that has that prefix of kilo built into it so we know a thousand meters or a thousand of anything that has kilo next to it so if we're talking about watts and we could say kilowatts or kilowatts and we know we have one thousand watts and all we had to do was say one kilowatt and the kilo built in told us what that meant in terms of the original unit or we could go the other way we can say microwatts and then you have ten to the minus six or a really small number so we can talk about numbers in a standard range just by using the prefixes is really convenient for us and we'll use that throughout all of general chemistry and we'll use different sets of them in different chapters where we're talking about something really large or something really small so you'll see when we get there and I'll tell you these are common prefixes that are used in this type of section okay so we're dealing with units of different types, sometimes it's uh, useful for us to have units that are not dependent upon how much material is present. This leads us to a discussion of intensive and extensive properties. So I realize these words are kind of different if you're not used to them, but think of extensive properties as properties that depend on the extent of the system. Is, it, is there a large extent of material? And then you're dealing with an extensive property. Your, your property depends ultimately upon the quantity of matter that you have present or upon the extent of matter that you have. So an extensive property would be something like mass, how many grams do you have? Or, um, you know, it, is it something that depends on how much is there?
in essence. 100 grams, 25 grams, depends on how much stuff is there, depends on the number that you give. But there are ways to talk about these units in terms of intensive properties. So intensive properties are better to deal with in the sense that they're not going to change based on how much stuff you have. And this makes it really great because then if your equation is in terms of intensive properties, it applies at all times and it doesn't matter how much stuff you have there, which is great. So these are properties that don't depend on the extent of your, sense of your system, an in intensive property. So this, uh, the main example that we'll deal with is density. That's the one coming up in the next slides. But also uh, temperature, for instance, doesn't depend on how much stuff you have. It only depends on um, your particular object at that time. What's its temperature? It doesn't matter if you have 100 pounds of something or if you have one pound, it can, they can both be at the same temperature. It's not dependent upon the extent of the system. Okay, so we're going to try to find ways to turn properties into intensive properties using extensive properties that we already know or that we can find. Uh, the classic example of this is using mass and volume to come up with density. So here you can see a graph. On the x-axis is the volume in cubic centimeters, and on the y-axis is the mass in grams. So if you're going to plot these things, here's the table that shows you the values, and then they're plotted. You can see the equation of the line y equals 8.38x. So for every x volume, you can plug that number in here, multiply by this value, and you find the y. So with the density, you can go from volume to mass, or you can go from mass to volume back and forth. The density is the ratio that allows you to convert between volumes and masses. It's also an intensive property. So if you have a sample of brass and you have a few of them that have different masses, you can find out their volume. You can make a nice plot. Notice it's a straight line. We call that a linear plot. So we take these two physical properties and these properties are extensive on their own because the amount of volume that you have depends on the extent of your system, the amount of mass depends on how much is in front of you, and combining them together you can find an intensive property. So what you're going to do then is just take the ratio of these two things, mass over volume. So in this case, since our units are grams and cubic centimeters, we're going to have grams per cubic centimeter, and that's going to be the density. So you know no matter how many grams you have, how much space it's going to take up, and you know no matter how many, um, what size of a system you have, you can calculate how much mass it will have, as long as you know the density. So it's a great thing, and that one particular number, the density, is not going to change based on how much stuff you have. It's an intensive property. So let's focus on density in a little more detail here. It's the ratio of mass to volume, as I said. It's an intensive property. And units that we're going to use typically are going to be grams per cubic centimeter. It's important to note and to remember, and to remember this often, one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. Now, a lot of times the textbook will bring stuff up to try to confuse you or to make you remember this. So it's a really helpful one. Put a star next to it. We're going to have to come back to it a few times. They're going to give us units. We're going to think they're not compatible, but we're going to remember one cubic centimeter is one milliliter, luckily. For liquids, normally we'll just say grams per milliliter, and so we'll shortcut the cubic centimeter business, but technically those units are the same both ways. Gases, it's a little cumbersome to talk about cubic centimeters or milliliters because that's a smaller unit, and so we're just going to say per liter. Gas is, the density of a gas is grams per liter. Uh, sometimes even in like physics, for example, you may do kilograms per cubic meter, and you just need larger sizes to deal with or units that are consistent in your equations, ultimately. Uh, the, it's interesting to note that the volume that you're going to use in this equation is almost always experimentally determined using Archimedes' principle. You basically put something into a, submerge it into some fluid, some water, and the amount of water that spills over the top that was displaced by that thing tells you how much space that thing took up. So perhaps you have a cylinder full to 100 milliliters. You put in a cube, and it goes up 10 more milliliters. And you know then that 10 milliliter difference must be the volume of this thing that I put in. And notice our units are grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. So you're reading milliliters off of this graduated cylinder. It just works out perfect. 
Uh, that's one way. If your object is really large or strange, um, it's harder to find the density of. But we won't really run into any of those situations. You should note that the density of solids is much greater than the density of liquids, which is much, much greater than the density of gases. Remember, gases have a lot of space between the molecules, so they take up a lot of space, and there's not a lot of mass in all that space. So the density is a lot smaller. Um, it is important to note there are some exceptions to this, and the most notable one is ice is less dense than liquid water, otherwise it wouldn't float, and that would be a catastrophe. So ultimately, density is mass over volume. Sometimes you'll see the Greek letter rho being used. Sometimes we'll use a smaller case d. In either case, um, you'll know what's going on, and that's it. So if density is mass over volume, then all you need to do to compare different materials together is just find a list of all the densities, which is what I have for you here, table 1.4. And note that the density changes if you change the temperature. Uh, that's due to a number of different things, mostly thermal expansion, uh, but not so important to us as long as we note what temperature that we're at when we're using these numbers. Okay, so you can list one number for all these different substances because it's an intensive property. That number will be the same no matter the extent of your system because it's intensive. So now you can convert back and forth between how much space will it take up and how much mass is there depending on what sample you have just by looking up the number in this table. Here's an example. Decide if a ring with a mass of 3.15 grams that displaces 0.233 cubic centimeters of water is platinum. So what I'm saying is I have something in front of me that is a ring, and I want to know if that ring is made out of platinum. How am I going to do it? Well, I remember that platinum has a particular density. That's an intensive property of platinum. It has a certain number. And you'll remember from the table that we just saw, each of these different materials have different densities. Notice platinum at the bottom, 21.4. So if I could find the density of this ring, and it is 21.4, I'll know I have platinum. That's the idea. So I know the mass. I took that ring, and I put it on a balance, and I weighed it out, and it told me 3.15 grams. And then I took that ring, and I put it in a graduated cylinder marked at 100 milliliters or 50 milliliters or whatever, and it went up by 0.233 milliliters. A cubic centimeter, milliliter, the same there. So 0.233 cubic centimeters of water. Now I know the mass and the volume. So all I have to do is take the mass and the volume and put the mass over the volume to get grams per cubic centimeter. So I use my equation, density is mass over volume. I plug in my numbers, 3.15 over 0.233, and I get 13.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So is it platinum? No, you'll remember platinum was 21.4. So therefore, this is not platinum. It's some other metal. Whoever sold it to you was not being truthful. Um, it's important to note with these problems, sometimes we're not going to be given grams straight up. We'll be given milligrams or kilograms or something else, and we'll have to use the prefix to convert to straight up grams. And we don't have to be given cubic centimeters either. We could be given gallons, and we could convert gallons to liters and liters to milliliters, which is the same as a cubic centimeter, and then plug it all into the equation. So they can give us a little extra front work to do sometimes. But in either case, as long as we remember mass over volume and we remember the units that we're trying to compare to, grams per cubic centimeter, then this won't be an issue. So we want to calculate density. What is the density of a brass sample if 100 grams added to a crystal, oh, excuse me, the density of a brass sample if 100 grams added to a cylinder of water causes the water level to rise from 25 milliliters to 36.9 milliliters. So how much did that water level change is what we're interested in. And if we can calculate that, we can find out, since we know 100 grams, we'll just take mass, grams, over volume, milliliters, cubic centimeters, and we'll be able to have density. So what is the density? I'm listing the information that we're given, and then we need to find the density. So I'm going to use mass and volume to get density. And this is my equation for density, mass over volume. So I just need to find out what that volume is. I take the level that it raised up to, 36.9. I subtract off 25, where we started, and I get 11.9 milliliters or 11.9 cubic centimeters. And then I take mass over that volume, and I get 8.403 grams per cubic centimeter. And therefore, rounding to the appropriate significant figures, 8.40 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's about what a brass sample should have. So that makes sense. 
So I said rounding to three significant figures. What exactly is that all about? Well, let's talk more about this in the next video.